Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you all to uh, our 16th session on the tafsir of Surah Al Anbiya. And alhamdulillah, we've reached uh, verse number 78, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi min ash shaytanir rajeem, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim, wa Dawood wa Sulaiman. إذ يحكمان في الحرث إذ نفشت فيه غنم القوم وكنا لحكمهم شاهدين. Allah says, and remember David and Solomon when they rendered judgment regarding the tillage, when the people's sheep strayed into it by night, and we were witness to their judgment. In the previous verses, <clears throat> there were references to the story of Ibrahim, the story of, uh, of Musa, Harun. The Quran also made mention of uh, Prophet Nuh, Prophet Ayyub, and continuing this discussion on the challenges and the hardships and some of the blessings that have been bestowed upon previous messengers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the next uh, few verses, He speaks of two prominent and distinguished prophets from among Bani Israel. Now, this ayah mentions Dawood and Sulaiman. Dawood alayhi salam and Sulaiman, they were unique in that they were both prophets and they also wielded immense political power. They were prophets and they were kings. And that, you know, is obviously a very rare combination. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Sa'd, Surah 38, ayah number 26, he says, Inna ja'alnaka, about Dawood, Ya Dawood, Inna ja'alnaka khalifatan fil ard. O David, we have appointed you as a vicegerent on earth. Fahkum bayna nasi bil haq. So judge between people on the basis of truth. Wala tattabi al hawa. And do not follow, do not succumb to your desires, for that will lead you away from the path of God. Dawood alayhi salam, he is famous and he became very well known after defeating Goliath. And after his defeat of Goliath in that very well known battle, he eventually rose to prominence and became the king of the Israelites. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after his defeat of Goliath, he was also appointed as a prophet. Now, when Dawood alayhi salam was in power, he was recognized as a prophet, as a king, he announced his successor. And his successor was, at the time, his son, Sulaiman, who was 13 years old. Now, when Dawood السلام, appointed Sulaiman as his wasi, you can imagine the reaction of the elders of Bani Israel. Many of them, they had an issue with that. They probably felt that, you know, this 13 year old boy is not qualified to succeed his father. So this ayah sheds light and speaks about an incident where Dawood alayhi salam essentially demonstrates to the Israelites the, 
the wisdom and the judicial prowess of Suleiman. So they have doubts that why, you know, why Suleiman, why is he being appointed as the successor of Dawood? And Dawood decides to make it clear to people why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen Suleiman to succeed his father. Not only in the sense of succeeding a king, you know, we're not talking about a monarchy, that he is to succeed his father as a prophet. Now, the ayah says, and remember David and Solomon when they rendered judgment regarding the tillage, when the people's sheep strayed into it by night, they strayed into that garden or that farm, and we were witness to their judgment. Now, this ayah has generated a lot of discussion among the mufassireen. Number one, the ayah does not speak about the details of this incident. You know, what was the case that was brought forward by the plaintiff? Some have read this verse and they've looked at some of the ahadith and they wonder how, how can two prophets issue a different judgment? You know, if they're all divinely inspired, if they're all guided by divine revelation, why is it that, you know, at least according to some narrations, why is it that Dawood gave a judgment, Suleiman gave a judgment, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we'll find in the next ayah, in ayah number 79, فَفَهَّمْنَاهَا Sulaiman. We made Solomon to understand it. So that's, that's the, the second question. So the first question is, what was the case? What, what was the background? What, what were the details regarding this judgment that was rendered? Number two, we have some narrations that suggest that Dawood issues a judgment, Suleiman issues, issues a judgment, and Allah endorses the judgment of Suleiman. So the question here is, you have two prophets who are guided by divine revelation. How is it possible that they have two different verdicts? Are they following ijtihad? Are they following conjecture? Or are they following divine revelation? If they're both following divine revelation, why do we see this divergence? And number three, did Solomon and David issue two independent judgments? So this is, uh, these are some of the questions that, uh, that were raised. So what was the incident? What was the basis of their judgment? What actually happened? And what is this verse talking about? Now, uh, of course, from the ayah, from the verse, we can't, we're not able to infer uh, the details of what happened. But we, we know from the verse that there were some sheep that, uh, that strayed into a farm, into an orchard, and presumably they destroyed the crops. Now, from the ahadith, we find that there was a grape farmer who complained that flocks of sheep belonging to a group of local shepherds had wandered into his vineyard at night and the sheep severely damaged his vines. They destroyed the crops. Now, according to Jewish law, so this is the, the Sharia of Musa, this is the, the Mosaic law. Now, the law demanded that you know, there, there's a shared responsibility uh, to protect the crops. And, the, and this shared responsibility is between the farmers and the shepherds. So the farmers were responsible during the day for keeping watch over their crops and warding off any unwanted grazers. So this was, these were the legal you know, statues if we wanna use you know, modern terms. So farmers were responsible 
to, they were responsible to keep their orchards, to keep their farms protected from unwanted grazers during the day. And in turn, shepherds were responsible during the night for keeping track of their flocks and preventing them from trespassing to, uh, to the, the farms. Now, the way that Dawood and previous prophets judged any cases, because you can imagine that this, this happened frequently. You have, you know, cattle, sheep, goats, you know, they, they wander into a farm, onto a farm, into an orchard, into a vineyard, and they destroy the crops. So these cases were very frequently brought before judges. And prophets, you know, they also acted as judges. You know, they adjudicated uh, conflicts between people. So according to Jewish law, if an animal, if shepherds were negligent and their animals trespassed, into a farm, into an orchard, into a vineyard, and they caused damage, the offending shepherds were required, according to Jewish law, to surrender enough heads of sheep to compensate for the damage. So for example, I'm a shepherd, and a few of my sheep enter into an orchard at night, into a farm at night. They damage some of the crops. However much the damage is, I have to give the farmer that number of sheep as compensation. And, and what would happen usually is that these sheep or these goats, whatever the, the animal was, oftentimes they would completely destroy the crops and even the roots. And it was not possible for those, uh, those specific crops to be salvaged. So this was the case that was brought to the court of Dawood. Now, Dawood, according to narrations, appoints Suleiman as his wasi. And you see that this is the, the legacy, this is the way of all prophets. They announce their successors early on in their mission. You know, you, even when you look at uh, the life of the prophet, he announced who his successor would be in Da'wat Dhul Ashira, for example, very early on when Imam Amir al muminin was barely a teenager. In any case, Dawood announces that Suleiman is his successor. Now there is, he gets pushback. People are skeptical of the ability of, of Suleiman. So this is an opportunity for Dawood to show that my son is not an ordinary 13-year-old boy. This is someone who's gifted with divine wisdom. Now, when you look at the ahadith surrounding this incident, there are a lot of uh, contradictory reports. So if you look at Bihar al-Anwar, you see conflicting reports. So traditions, they differ widely over the details uh, of this judgment. So some, you, so we have essentially three categories of ahadith. We have one group of narrations that claim that both David and Solomon issued contradictory verdicts. So the verdict that was given by Dawood was the, the shepherd has to surrender X amount of sheep to the farmer to compensate for the damage. Suleiman, is his judgment is that no, the shepherds retain ownership of the uh, of their sheep, but they have to surrender any lamb that is born in that year and that season, and they have to give milk and give wool to the farmers to compensate for the the damage. So some hadith mentioned that there was a contradictory judgment. A second category of narrations claim that only one verdict was issued, and that, and that was the verdict of Suleiman. Everything else was just a discussion between the two. So any 
you know, uh, consultation or deliberation that took place. You know, Daoud had an opinion, Suleiman had opinion, but those, the back and forth happened behind closed doors privately. It was only one verdict that was issued and that was issued by Suleiman. The third group of narrations, and I feel that this is probably the most accurate and I'll explain why, and that is Dawood David wholly refrained from passing judgment and immediately referred the case to Suleiman to demonstrate his wisdom and prowess in judgment. Now, why do I feel that this third version is more accurate? Because number one, it doesn't make sense that two prophets of God who are inspired by divine revelation would give contradictory judgments. That just, that doesn't make sense. That would call into question, you know, even that would call into question whether or not they're acting on divine, uh, are they acting based on wahi or are they acting based on their own, uh, you know, opinions. So the first is, is definitely uh, implausible. And in fact, it's not even a smart way to run a government. Can you imagine you have a government and then you have Dawood issue, he's the king, he issues a judgment and then his successor also issues a judgment. So that's that's just bad government. So so we can eliminate the first group of narrations as just being implausible. Number two, those who claim that the judgment was given by Suleiman alone, but there was deliberation that happened between Suleiman and his father privately. Now, this is also unlikely because Dawood, according to narrations, is trying to demonstrate that Suleiman is worthy of being his successor, that he's worthy of Nubuwa. And if, if Dawood were to privately meet with his son, the elders who were skeptical of Suleiman's ability, they would have said that, oh, you coached him. Oh, Dawood, you coached your son. And you basically told him what the judgment should be. So it, it would, there would be no, uh, it wouldn't be a remarkable incident. So this incident basically quelled any, any doubts that people had about Suleiman's ability. So the more likely, the, the more uh, plausible version is that this, this issue, this case was brought to Dawood. Dawood immediately refers it to his his son, Suleiman, without any private deli del deliberation, and he's able to issue a judgment on a case that has no precedence. Now, why doesn't it have any precedent? It's because all of the previous cases, what happened was the, the cattle, the sheep, the goats that would trespass, they would damage the crops in a way that was not salv salvageable. Basically, the roots would be destroyed. So in the past, animals used to completely destroy the plants in such a way that they would not recover in the subsequent growing seasons. Now, in this specific case, what happened was the sheep destroyed the crops, but the roots were retained meaning the roots were still left intact. The crops were not completely destroyed. So because this was slightly different from all of the previous cases that the past prophets of many Israel had ruled, had given judgment about, this was a unique case. And you find that Suleiman gives a unique judgment. And that is that the shepherds retain ownership of their sheep and they compensate the damage by giving the milk and the wool and any offspring that is produced by the sheep in that year until the cost of the damage is recuperated. And therefore you find that in ayah number 79, Allah says, فَفَهَمْنَاهَا Sulaiman." We made Sulaiman to understand it meaning that it, it was a case 
that was unprecedented. It required, you know, a high degree of uh, judicial precision, and Suleiman made the right judgment. And, and to both, we gave judgment and knowledge. And this refutes any cl the claim that Dawood and Suleiman gave contradictory judgments. Allah says we gave judgment and knowledge to both of them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَسَخَّرْنَا Then he mentions a specific miracle that he bestowed upon Dawood. وَسَخَّرْنَا مَعَ دَاوُودَ الْجِبَالِ يُسَبِّحْنَ وَالطَّيْرِ وَكُنَّا فَاعِلِينَ We compelled the mountains and the birds to glorify with David. And we did this. Now, from other verses in the Qur'an, we understand that everything in existence, without exception, has a certain degree of consciousness. It has a certain degree of awareness. It has a certain degree of cognitive activity, even if it's at a very uh, minimal level. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Isra, Surah 17, ayah number 44, He says, تُسَبِّحُ لَهُ السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضِ The heavens in their entirety and the earth glorify God. They glorify Allah. Not only that, it's not just that the universe as a whole, وَإِن مِّن شَيْءٍ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِهِ Every, there is not a single thing but that it glorifies God. It celebrates His, His glory. It celebrates His praise. So anything that you can think of, whether it's a plant, an animal, a, a single cell organism, an atom, a subatomic particle, a planet, a galaxy, you name it. You fill in the blank. Everything does tasbih. Everything glorifies its creator. But the problem is what? It's not perceptible to us. Walakin, Allah says, Walakin la tafqahuna tasbihahum. The problem is that you do not understand their praise. It's happening at every moment, but you can't detect it. You cannot ascertain, you cannot decipher that cosmic tasbih. Innahu kana haliman ghafura. So we know this is, this is happening. In Surah an nur Surah 24, Ayah number 41, there is a specific mention of birds because the ayah says that the mountains and the birds did tasbih along with David. Ayah number 41 of Surah An-Nur, أَلَمْ تَرَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ يُسَبِّحُ لَهُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَالطَّيْرِ صَافَاتِ كُلٌّ قَدْ عَلِمَ صَلَاتَ وَتَسْبِحَ Don't you see that to God, everything in the heavens and in the earth offers praise and the birds that spread their wings, all of them, they know their prayers, they know their salah and their tasbih. So even the birds in this ayah seem to perform, they, have a, they glorify God, but they also seem to have a more formal type of Worship. They have a type of salah that they perform. Again, we don't know, we cannot interpret, we cannot understand the way that they worship, the way that they glorify God. Now, 
the miracle of Dawood, at least one of his miracles, was that this natural exaltation that's happening became audible. Meaning that when Dawood used to do tasbih, people would be able to hear the mountain and the birds echoing his tasbih. That it was a type of mu'jiza, that when Dawood did tasbih, it seemed like everything around him became synchronized with him. It started to also do tasbih. And the fact that Allah mentions the fact that the mountains and the birds did tasbih along with Dawood, this is the only possible, this is the only way that we can understand this because the everything is doing tasbih and everything is doing tasbih with all prophets. So there's something special about Dawood. And the Mufassirin mentioned that this tasbih that is usually silent to us at least. With Dawood, it became audible. But people were given a glimpse. They were able to understand. They were able to at least hear that tasbih when Dawood would glorify and when he would celebrate the praise of his Lord. So this natural exaltation became audible. And this was one of the miracles of uh, of Dawood. Allah says, and we did this. This was only possible through our permission. We are the ones who facilitated this, uh, this miracle. Wakunna fa'alim. Ayah number 80. And we taught him, meaning David. And we taught him how to make garments for you to protect against your own might, to protect in battle. But are you thankful? Now, as we mentioned, Dawood alayhi salam was a king. He was a prophet and he was a king. Now, most kings live very lavish lives. They're very ostentatious. But Dawood salam, even though he was a king, he lived a very humble life. He lived a very humble life. He did, however, depend on the public treasury for his personal uh, expenses. You know, he's the king and this this happens with most uh, heads of state that their their salary is is taken from the public treasury. It's part of the the government's budget. Yes. There is a narration that says Allah once told Dawood, Ya Dawood, O Dawood, O David, you would be a perfect servant if only you did not depend on the public treasury. You would be the perfect abd, the perfect servant, if you earned your own livelihood and did not depend on the public treasury. Now when Allah revealed this to Dawood, he began to weep profusely because he felt that he, he had fallen short of Allah's expectations. Now he didn't commit a sin, but he, he felt embarrassed that he had fallen beneath the divine standard that was set for him. So what did, he, what did he decide to do? The narrations mentioned that he decided to devote some time every day, a few hours every day, to weave strips of palm leaves into mats with his own hands. He used to weave baskets and mats. So he started to, to do some manual labor. He started to manufacture mats and baskets and he would sell them in the marketplace. Now imagine he's a king, Dawood alayhi salam. He would go and he would sell these straw mats and these baskets 
And the money that he would earn, he would buy uh, some ingredients and he would make barley bread that he would eat. So this is what he used to do to provide for himself. So he stopped depending on the public treasury for his livelihood. Now, on seeing Dawood make such a noble effort, when Allah saw that Dawood made such a noble effort to earn a lawful livelihood, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to Dawood that he would teach him the art of black, uh, blacksmithing. And that would, uh, that would be more profitable and more useful for him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches Dawood how to melt iron to the consistency of warmed wax. You know, when you, when you warm up wax, it becomes very malleable. So Dawood learned how to soften and how to melt iron and he would shape uh, he would shape the iron and he started to manufacture armor and shields to protect against uh, uh, attacks so it would be used uh, as part of their uh, as part of their defense and subhanallah you know brothers and sisters sometimes you know we take these things for granted that you know, we assume, we forget that a lot of these things that we have today, many of it, many of it is through prophets. You know, some of the things that have been invented, it could be that this has been, this is inspiration that has come from God through his awliya, and then eventually it reaches uh, common people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we taught him how to make garments. You know, after he demonstrated his desire to earn a livelihood and be and uh, be independent and not rely on the public treasury, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught him how to melt iron and uh, manufacture uh, coats of mail. Ayah number 81. tajri bi amrihi ila al-ard allati barakna fiha. And to Solomon, the wind blowing, meaning when we made subservient to him the wind blowing violently, it ran by his command. It ran by his command to the land that we had blessed and we know all things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here mentions Sulaiman, the son of Dawood. And he mentions some of his favors upon Dawood. Some of the things that he enabled uh, Sulaiman to do. And one of the things that's mentioned here, one of the miracles, one of the supernatural abilities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to Sulaiman was that he was able to manipulate the wind. Now, brothers and sisters, I don't think there's anyone in the world today who has developed technology that can adjust the weather, right? You know, that can manipulate the wind. You know, wind, you know, when wind becomes violent and and uh, powerful, you know, we call them hurricanes or tornadoes, and they can destroy the most sophisticated civilization. Just wind. Allah doesn't need to do anything. He just sends wind, and he can completely wipe out an entire country. Allah gave the ability to Sulaiman to manipulate the wind. The wind used to blow according to his, his command. Now, there are a, a number of verses in the Quran that mention this idea of the wind being under the control of Sulaiman. In, uh, in Surah Saba, and this is a very interesting uh, verse, Surah Saba, Surah 34, ayah number 12. Sulaiman shahrun wa shahr. 
Allah mentions that, and to Suleiman, we, we subjugated the wind, we made the wind subservient to him. It conveyed him in a morning the distance traveled in a month by any other conveyance and conveyed him in the afternoon, the distance traveled in a month by any other conveyance. So what this ayah is essentially saying that when Suleiman would travel in his ships, for example, because he, he had control over the wind and he could increase the speed of the wind, he was able to travel in one morning what it normally took people one month to travel. In one morning, he would, he would be able to travel the distance of one month using any other mode of transportation that was available at that time. And in the evening, he was able to, in, in the afternoon, he could travel the distance of one month using the conventional means of transportation at the time. So between the morning and the afternoon, Suleiman was able to travel a distance that would have taken two months under the normal circumstances of his time. Because he had, Allah gave him the ability to manipulate the wind. Now, why does the verse say that, and to Solomon, the, we gave him the wind blowing violently, it ran by his command. Does that mean that he only controlled the strong winds and he didn't control the gentle winds? No. What it means is that, you know, it's it's implicit that if he's if he has control over strong winds, violent winds, he would naturally have authority and power and command over the gentle winds. It ran by his command to the land that we had blessed. Again, this is a reference to the Levant, you know, the area of Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Jerusalem. This is where uh, Suleiman lived and therefore he spent most of his time there and he was able to control the wind from that blessed land. And Allah says, and we know all of this. Allah says, I am the only one who knows how to manipulate the wind. That I have made the wind subservient to Suleiman. So again, Put yourself in the shoes of the Prophet and the early Muslim community who are being persecuted, who are a minority, who are overwhelmed by their enemies, who are facing all of these trials and tribulations. Allah is saying to them that the same Lord who put the wind under the command of Sulaiman, he is with Muhammad. He is supporting you. Look at how Allah blessed and showed favor upon all of the previous prophets. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you. He has power over all things. He knows all things. So this is, again, uh, a, a sort of consolation to the prophet and to the early Muslims. Verse number 82, again, continuing the discussion uh, about Sulaiman. What, what, what else did Allah give to Sulaiman? And this is very, uh, very interesting. Among the Satans are those who dove deep for him and performed other deeds besides this. And we guarded them. Suleiman السلام, he had servants who were human beings and he also had jinn. Jinn were also made subservient to Suleiman. They were part of his army. They, they worked under him. They were under his command. Now here Allah says, and from among the jinn, there were shayateen. Among the Satans, the Shayateen, are those who dove deep for him. Now, there are narrations that say that 
Some jinn, Allah made them assume a material form so they could uh, perform work for Suleiman. And Allah says that some of them, and these were, were the wicked ones. So this was a type of punishment for them that Allah made them. He compelled them. He forced them to serve Suleiman. And Allah says in this ayah that some of them used to dive into the seas. They were deep divers, and they would extract pearls and precious stones from the bottom of the seas. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine having this type of authority that not just any jinn, the sinful jinn, the ones who are, who are disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even, even the enemies of God, Allah made them ser serve Sulaiman. So they would dive deep into the the seas, and they would extract this val these valuable jewels and stones for Suleiman. And they used to perform other deeds besides this. Now, what else did they used to do for Suleiman? Ayah number 13 of Surah Saba mentions. So number one, they used to build for him whatever he wanted. Whatever Suleiman wanted, he would give the order, and these jinn were basically industrial workers. They would manufacture, they would build whatever he wanted. And then Allah gives examples of some of the things that they would construct. They used to construct temples for him. And sculptures of trees. Now, the verse only says sculptures, but we know that it's haram to build a, uh, a sculpture of something that has a soul. So the hadith mentioned that these sculptures were sculptures of trees. And they would construct bowls the size of small pools. So if you think like of a swimming pool, they would construct bowls the size of swimming pools for him. And pots, وَقُدُورٍ rasiat, And pots, you know, that, that they would use for food. Pots that were built into the earth. They were fixed into the earth. The pots were like valleys. So you, I mean, you can only imagine the type of kingdom that, that was built for Suleiman. And then Allah, at the end of the ayah, he says, he says, وَكُنَّا لَهُمْ حَافِظِينَ And we guarded them. You know, these shayateen, these jinn, many of them, obviously they would want to escape. You know, who wants to work day and night, you know, doing manual labor? Shayateen, they wanted to leave. But Allah in Surah uh, Saba, same Surah, Ayah number 12, وَمِنَ الْجِنِّ مَنْ يَعْلَمُ بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ بِإِذْنِ رَبِّ So the jinn would work. Hours and hours, day and night, they would work in front of him. And then Allah says, and this was happening by the command of God. وَمَنْ يَزِغْ مِنْهُمْ عَنْ أَمْرِنَا Whoever veers away from the command of God, whoever tries to, you know, uh, make a run for it or fail in fulfilling uh, what was been, has been imposed upon them, نُذِقْهُ مِنْ عَذَابِ السَّعِيرِ God would burn them uh, with a, a blaze of fire. So they were coerced into serving Sulaiman. Now, what's the message here? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet and telling the Muslims that I, I am so powerful that if I want, I can even make your enemies serve you. I can even make your enemies subservient to you. And we see this even in the story of Musa. The arch enemy of Musa is who? Fir'aun. Look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises Musa. He puts, he puts him in the palace of Fir'aun and he makes Fir'aun raise him. So Allah is essentially saying that, oh Fir'aun, 
I am so powerful that I will make you raise Musa and then Musa will overthrow you. So Allah again, consoling the Prophet that your Lord, the same Lord that made the shayateen subservient to Sulaiman, I am the same Lord that if I want, I can even make your enemies serve you. That what they do will work to your benefit. Uh, with that, inshallah, we'll conclude. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabina Muhammad wa ala ahli bayti al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Inshallah, in our next uh, session, we'll, uh, so the next ayah speaks about, uh, I believe, Ayyub. So we'll cover that, inshallah, next week. If there are any questions or comments, uh, we, can, uh, we can take them. So uh, referring to the heavens and the earth uh, glorifying God, uh, does that necessarily refer to an active glorification? Or could it be that uh, their mere existence is a glorification of God. So, <clears throat> some commentators have made that argument. They say that the meaning of these inanimate objects, exalting God, it just means that by virtue of their existence and them fulfilling their function, you know, they're following that divine order, that that is their tasbih. But the problem is, that would mean that you and I have understood their tasbih. But Allah explicitly says in the Quran that you do not understand their tasbih. So if we give a, if we give a theory as to what is the meaning of their tasbih, maybe it's the fact that their, their mere existence or their their uh, their place in creation, the fact that they fulfill their function. If we say that's the meaning of their tasbih, we're contradicting the explicit word of God, which is that you we don't understand their tasbih, nor will we ever understand their tasbih. So some scholars have made that argument, but I don't think it holds because the Quran says they do tasbih, walakin la tafqahun, but you do not understand and. Tafqahun is a present and a future tense verb. So it seems that we, we, don't, we just don't have the ability to decipher the nature of that exaltation. Uh, that's interesting. This is a, it incorporates the future tense as well, that you don't have the possibility of understanding it. Yeah, because fi'al uh, mudara, the present tense uh, verb is used in the... Uh, in the verse, and that would indicate present and future tense. And, uh, one thing that was interesting was that we were given all these uh, miracles of Prophet Dawood and Prophet Suleiman, but with Prophet Suleiman, what's often considered his, like, his greatest miracle of talking to animals, that's not even mentioned in these verses. So again, I mean, the, the, these verses are not mentioning all of... Uh, all of their miracles. Now, his miracles are mentioned in uh, in other uh, other like Surah An Naml, for example, mentions the, his miracle of speaking to uh, communicating with ants. Dawood and Sulaiman they understood the language of beards or limna But here, it's it only mentions uh, the uh, the wind being subservient to him, and uh, and the fact that you have these these mysterious creatures, these supernatural creatures, jinn, who are, who are basically under uh, his command. And uh, what is the significance of Zabur, the book of David, from the Islamic perspective? Now, the Zabur, it means the Psalms of David. Now, we know that the Zabur, so the Zabur is basically a, it's a, it's a divine book, but it's not, it's not a, a scripture that is like Tawrat or the Injil or the Quran. And the reason why is because the Zabur, the Psalms of David does not introduce uh, religious law. 
it's a book that essentially, uh, it's a book of prayer of supplication that speaks about more of some of the, the, the spiritual and the ethical teachings of, uh, of the religion. So it's not a book that outlines uh, or that would abrogate uh, uh, Mosaic law. So unlike the Torah and the Quran and the Inji that, uh, that, that contain the combination of, uh, of legal precepts as well as ethical uh, directives, the, the Psalms seems to be devoid of any, uh, of any ahkam, uh, any legal uh, you know, rulings. And, and subhanAllah, even the, the Injil, I mean, if you look at, so Dawood has the, the Zabur, Isa alayhi salam has the Injil. The, the problem of Bani Israel was not in their practice of, of law. You know, a lot of them had mastered Jewish law, but many of them had, had lost the spirit of the law. And that's why you have Isa alayhi salam emphasizing, you know, uh, love and mercy and speaking about you know being detached from the worldly life, the zabur focusing on spirituality. So many of the the rabbis and many of the uh, the religious uh, members of the Jewish community they became so fixated on the religious law that uh, that they started to forget and uh, ignore the essence of the law and what what is the ultimate aim of uh, of these uh, religious laws. And we see the same, I would argue, even in the Muslim community. You know, some of us, we get so caught up with halal and haram and that we forget, you know, the, the essence and the spirit of the, the religious tradition. And thankfully we have, you know, people like Imam Zain al-Abideen with his munajat and his dua to remind us that, you know, it's, Islam is not just a legal tradition now. The legal, Parameters are important, but that's just the the shell. You know, the, the kernel is uh, is really the the spirituality and you know those higher ideals that we have to strive for. Thank you. And why did Dawood build the temple? Uh, was it meant for praying Tawheed? So so temple doesn't mean. Uh, so again, when temple is a reference to uh, a place, uh, a place of worship. So it's what we what we would call a masjid, and it was governed by the uh, by Jewish law, which is the Sharia of Musa. So the word masjid was not uh, uh, common at the time. So so tamathil refers to uh, temples as in uh, places of worship. I mean, th this is where Maryam Sam was worshiping in the temple. So, uh, so that's that's what's being uh, referred to. So, ma maharib, our temple. So we know we know the word mahrab. It's like the prayer niche. So uh, he had them build. Uh, Suleiman would have the jinn build uh, temples. And uh, why were these miracles not given to the Ululazm prophets? Why were these miracles not given to the uh, the Ulul Azam prophets? Now, again, every every prophet is given a miracle that is uh, that is compatible and appropriate for his time. You know, so so perhaps these miracles were uh, were not uh, these miracles were appropriate for uh, for the time. You know, Isa alayhi salam, his miracle was you know healing the the sick, restoring eyesight to the blind. And so on and so forth, because because the you know the doctors and physicians were held in high esteem at the time. During the time of Musa, sorcerers were seen as the elite of the society. During the time of the Prophet, you know, language was the most important thing. Poets were seen as the elite of the society. So every prophet is given miracles that are suitable for his time. So presumably during the time of uh, Suleiman, for example, people probably were dabbling with, with, uh, with magic, and uh, and you you see that he kind of he, uh, you know, so it, it could be that this is the reason why he was given uh, this ability to kind of crush 
any other claim of uh, uh, anyone who was claiming a sorcery at the time. And Allah knows best. Like, why these specific miracles? We don't know. But we do know, according to the Ahlul Bayt, that there's wisdom behind why Allah gives certain miracles to uh, to certain prophets. And there is a, there's a compatibility. There's, there's, uh, there's wisdom behind why this miracle is assigned for this prophet and for that time period. It's... Uh, <clears throat> It's it's a, it's an appropriate time for that miracle. Thank you. And I guess we don't, we don't really know what the what, what was being held in high esteem during the times of these two prophets. Yeah, we, we don't know. We don't know. I mean, and again, you know, why wind? You know, why not have the the sun and sun rise and set by his command? So again, Allah decides what ability he wants to confer to, uh, he wants to grant to his servants. But we know that it's not arbitrary. Allah doesn't function based on, you know, you know arbitrary, uh, just arbitrarily assigning these abilities. There's hikmah. We might, we might not know the wisdom, but we know that there is a, there is a reason why they were given these, these abilities. And it's all, it's really, it all comes down to bolstering their credibility. That, you know, at the end of the day, these are people who are making a claim that they are chosen by God, that they receive divine revelation. And the general rule of thumb is that Allah gives miracles to all of these prophets to establish their credibility, that they are, in fact, divinely chosen. Because anyone can claim to be a prophet. So what separates false prophets from true prophets is, of course, their, uh, their, their character, their moral excellence. And also their uh, their ability to perform miracles. Thank you very much, Sheikh. The fascinating stories, as usual. Inshallah, I hope you guys benefited. Inshallah, we will uh, resume bi'idnillah next uh, next week. <laughs>